Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is going to be the dynamics of the So, thank, thank you for coming. Uh, yeah, we have the two speakers today. The first will be Jason, who will be talking about cats, very little bit. So, there's us. And after we'll take a 10 minute break, and we have to see them from real life. We'll be talking about one or nine things that they are using out there today. So, yeah, let's talk about Jason for our first one. Uh, there's a lot of overhead, 
But if, even if, if you choose to strike threats or requests, request, there's also, there's also this one here. But it's, 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 it's less, less, but there's still this overhead in context switching. Even when there's like close to zero context switching, uh, your, uh, you, let's say when you actually put a new thread onto a CPU, uh, your, your cache in your CPU will be invalidated. So that's why there's, there's this thing called the thread affinity. People who use Linux and, and maybe Windows, I think you can do that. Uh, that's when you want to squeeze more the performance in your multi thread program. Uh, it allows thread affinity allows you to lock down threads to a single CPU so that you prevent cache invalidation. Uh, yeah, so please learn this. The more popular way right now uh, that people are doing is the async event loop. So uh, this is something used by Node.js and Matty under the hood. So this is what an event loop looks like. So basically every, everything runs in a single thread and there's this main loop that keeps checking if the operations are done. So by operations, I mean like incoming server requests, file file, and things like that. And also timeouts. So uh, if it's not done, it goes on to check other operations and all, any of those operations are done, it will actually process the callbacks. Uh, so you can think of it like a waiter at a restaurant. So uh, when a waiter takes an order, you will actually take the order and put it on a queue and pass it off to the kitchen. So the kitchen would actually pop off the request for orders from this queue. And in the meantime, the waiter is free to serve the rest of the restaurant. Uh, when the food is ready, the kitchen will place it at the counter and the waiter will actually take the food and serve it to the, the customers. So that's like, uh, and, and in between these steps, when things are at the queue, the waiter is free to process any other thing and serve other tables inside it. However, in a synchronous scenario, let's say it's a single thread waiter, the single thread waiter will take the order, go to the kitchen, wait in the kitchen, wait until the order is done, then you'll take the food and serve it to the customer. So that's a synchronous scenario versus uh, async scenario. So we'll find you a better place. That's why it's a synchronous No jazz is able to serve many requests per second. And that's great, right? So, um, yeah, that's, that's very traditional, and that's why we use Node.js and event loops, right? Uh, but here's, here's, here's the thing, here's the big problem with event loops, uh, which is callbacks. Event loops have to use callbacks to uh, tell you that there are operations like that. Uh, and this is a typical code. Ah, it's a bit dark. What you guys can see, so it's like a, 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 a heavily nested uh, callback code. So, I then actually I use like a background. Uh, so for I think as of right now, this is a big meme that is online for JavaScript where it's like when you use HTML as a callback. So I won't really talk about this as a big cause for callbacks. Uh, it's not worth like bashing how long it's really become a meme. Uh, I think the big one of the big things that callbacks suffer from is that error handling. So um, there are many questions to ask that like, this code, like for example, what happens when there's an error in the S? Uh, at that point, you have spam, you have M, and you have some resources actually uh, they come on to. So if there's an exception, what happens to the resources? Who is going to clean it up? And uh, how do you actually proceed after that? So you could try to use try and catch blocks, but honestly, it really gets hard to manage after a while because of those implicit control flows. Uh, and typically, when you want to catch an exception, you might want to have multiple exception handlers as well. And those actually add to the complexity of the code. So, um, a solution that people have been using for uh, quite some time are futures. Um, a future is just represents a computation that has completed or is still ongoing. So, in the JavaScript community, people are using promises right now. Uh, it's a very similar concept to futures. So let's just look at how um, futures look like in the typical Scala code. So in this piece of code is semantically the same as the one before. So uh, as you can see, it's easier to read. Uh, it reads like uh, it's easier to read because it reads. It looks like it's currently code. Uh, Full happens first, after followed by bar, after that followed by dash, and lastly you make your breakfast with your spam ham and sausage. So um, yeah, so it looks better, right? Compared to this mess. So, um, but what happens if I try to do a little bit of refactor? So, right here, I take this out, I assign it to x a, a variable, and I put x right there. 
So, yeah, is it the same as before? Yeah, well, what do you guys think? <laughs> well, the answer is no, uh, because it just uh, handles the operations that it's running or has completed. So, the best is like the database connection or the database insert, for example. Uh, the insert has really happened before full and before R. Uh, so, um, and why is that a case? Why is this no longer the same piece of code? Uh, well, so on this side, a term for that. Uh, it's called referential transparency. So, referential transparency, sorry, is a big word. Uh, this just means that uh, the expression can be replaced or substituted by its result without changing the meaning of code. So, let me give you some example. Let me give you some example. Right. So, very simple example right here. I assign a pair of integers to a variable. So, um, what if I decide to do some refactoring? I refactor 42 to a uh, variable and actually put it into the same pair. Is this is the top code the same as the bottom code? Yeah. I see some bugs. Say again. I can. You mean like is it is that a reference or a value? Yeah. Uh, value, value. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, it's the same. Yeah, because um, x is a uh, literal. Uh, sorry, integers are literals. Uh, it represents the value itself, and so are doubles, and so are strings. Those are literals. So all these expressions are referential as well. But what about this? I try to do this. Is the code on the top same as the code at the bottom? No. No. All right. Why? Any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I hope that's quite obvious to you guys uh, that the print line is something like twice at the top. Is that the memory once at the bottom? Uh, so I, I agree that example is quite contrived, but maybe try to replace green line with inserting the same row in the database twice. So if I want to do that and I try to refactor at the bottom, uh, I'm only going to insert the database once. So uh, hope by now there's some kind of intuition of what referential transparency means. It just means that so code that's not referential transparency it just means that there's some kind of side effect happening. Uh, side effect by side effect means like it's a thing in the database or flipping to the console. So yeah, so basically those kind of code I mentioned uh, contains these things called effects. So what are effects? Pretty simply effects are code that doesn't just take a parameter and return a result. It does more than that. Uh, that includes things like reading a file, connecting the database, and there are two kinds of effects I really want to highlight, which maybe some um, all those right there, and some speakers right there, nobody really mentioned. One of it is mutating memory uh, when there's a variable. Uh, when you're mutating a variable, that is also an effect. The second thing is when you're throwing exceptions, that is also an effect. The reason why is because this, when a function or method throws an exception, it does more than just taking a variable, taking a parameter and return a value. It's actually changing the control flow. So, how do you manage that? How do you manage effects? And have referential transparency read about call service and connect the database. So enter the IO monad. Before I explain what IO and IO monad is, I just want to quickly talk about what's monad. Um, to really put it very simply, a monad is just a way to sequence computations. Um, there's also a monad tutorials right there, and um, people are like calling it a burrito. A box. I thought those are terrible analogies. I think the best way to really understand what a monad is is just to look at the definition of a monad. So just the definition of a monad in Scala. Um, basically, uh, a train. Before that, I was just trying to quickly explain what's a train. A train is actually a interface in Java. For those who are not familiar, and um, this f square bracket that is called name just says it's a generic container type. So a generic computer type could be like option list, those are what it's. Um, and the first method it needs to have in a trait for monad is pure. Uh, in Haskell, it's return 
uh, basically you just take the value of the gauge of net. The second method is um, flat net. What it does is actually the sequencing of a monad wave. So you want to make uh, that A followed by MP. So what it does is it takes a monad with type A and applies the function to it and returns the same monad with type B. So this guarantees that that A will always be followed by that B. So yeah, uh, in Scala, the, the library that people tend to use uh, to really uh, work with monads is CATS. CATS is the library that gives you uh, monad instances and synthetic, very nice synthetic features to work with these monads. Uh, you guys can go check it out on shared sites, that's uh, your at the bottom. And uh, the one I really want to talk about today is CATS Effect. So CATS Effect is a library that's built on CATS and provides two things. First is the IO monad. Uh, it represents the IO monad represents an action. It's kind of like a function that's not yet evaluated. And think of it like a declarative description of an action. And the second thing it gives you is an effect runtime. Um, some effects runtime out there are like Tokyo from Rust, for example. Uh, I'll explain what a runtime is uh, if I I think it'd be easier to explain if I show you a piece of code than cast effect. Yeah, so this is a piece of code in cast effect. Um, the kind of code that you probably write in your one one program one one class. So what it does is it prompts prom the user for a number, uh, pass the number, and then prints the uh, Fibonacci numbers all the way until the end. And uh, so the first set of Fibonacci numbers are uh, uh, list of numbers and also the factorial and so pretty simple code, um, but, but um, I also want to quickly explain why this. Is, sorry, I want to quickly explain why this for you data is top and bottom. Uh, for you is actually synthetic sugar for SCAR. What it does is takes uh, code that looks like this in a very imperative way and converts it into this, which sequence it using flat max one after another. So this code is semantically, sorry, semantically the same as the previous one. This one. Yeah. So um and um for what's happening right here in they see the IO delay. So this IO delay, what it does is that it takes a combination uh, and puts it in the lazy tongue. So hence my top title cats with those and laziness. No credits, guys. Right. So anyway, uh, uh, so I will delay most arguments in a lazy tongue. Uh, it delays the compilation or effect and wraps it in the IO world. Uh, what it does is it gives you this ability to compose the IO and also uh, put it with other IO effects and it gives you most body referential transparency. So right now, if I choose to refactor that prompt, put it in the prompt here, Variable and put it in my for uh, this for you block right here. Uh, this print line is not going to happen when I run my main method. It will only happen when I evaluate the program right here in my main method. So, yeah, uh, this is 100% referential transparency. And uh, so, I think let me go back to the unrefactored code because it's easier to read. And since IO is a generic type, when I do IO.read line right there, it returns an IO of stream. So previously, if I do an IO of delay with a print line, it gives me an IO of unit. So now if I do a read line with an IO of stream, and I could actually comment on it to actually convert it to an IO of mutation. So it's a generic type, very straightforward, I hope. So um, the interesting thing here is right here, the last line, where you see the program dot unsafe run sync. This is where I actually call the effect, effects runtime to actually evaluate my code. So um, to actually explain what is happening when I call unsafe run sync, I want just want to quickly talk about what happens when you run a piece of Scala code on the Scala runtime. So uh, for those familiar with JVM and uh, Java and Scala compilers, please bear with me. I'm just using a very simplified um, view of what happens when you uh, run code. So what happens when you run a piece of code on uh, the Scala runtime is, uh, is this. So whatever it does, uh, whenever you have a print line like that, when you have a simple main function that's impure and you're printing directly to the console, what's happening is that your code is going to just run immediately. There's no distinction between the description of the code and the action itself. So there's no dis distinction between the description of the action and the action itself. 
So calling the green line is going to execute it directly on the Scala right time. So there's no way to compose it. There's no way to manipulate it. And also, if you're planning to do concurrent code, uh, you're going to manage your threads. You're going to manage your own thread pools. And if you block on something, you're going to have to like fork a thread and handle uh, handle that computation manually on your own. So that's very low level IO programming. And uh, but with the IO monad. And in fact, runtime evaluator, it gives us this thing at the heart of computer science abstractions. So the IO monad captures the description and the actions of uh, your code, all the effects uh, and all the actions inside this thing called an IO ESL. Yeah, so it's like a descriptor of your actions. And it passes this code to evaluate the, yeah. So I think it would be easier if I had this diagram to explain to you guys. So it takes the what's happening when I run unsafe run thing is uh, I'll take the IODSL, which is that code right there, where you guys saw in the previous slides, uh, pass it off to an effects runtime. This effects runtime, you can think of it like an interpreter, uh, interprets the code and then sends it off to the Scala runtime. So, yeah, uh, and what we have here is actually very, very powerful. Since I always a description of an action, you could manipulate it, you could compose it just as you would manipulate and compose data. So if you're familiar with homo iconicity, code as data, anyone? Like list, scheme, bracket? No idea. Okay, so okay. meta circular and evaluator, anyone? Okay, yes, I see some nods. It's the same thing. So eventually, essentially, this is your evaluator running on top of another evaluator, but for another piece of code. So, uh, but what it gives you is uh, lots of insight over your code, lots of, uh, and it might even optimize your code because it understands your code better. Um, so for example, if you're writing concurrent code, um, it, it actually understands that, oh, you're actually gonna block here on the thread. So I'm gonna actually put another fiber, put another thread onto the CPU and go on running. So you don't have to manage this manually. You don't have to manage your threads, your thread pools manually. And if you're going to squeeze more performance, uh, like if you, you don't have to even think of thread affinity manually. So with an effects runtime like this cat's effect, it handles it for you. So there are also little nifty things that this library gives you. Like for example, the resource type. This resource is also a monad, uh, but at a high level, what it does is that it encapsulates three things. Uh, first is the resource itself. The second is the creation of resource. And third is the deletion of resource. So if I create a resource, so right here, um, I just show you guys how to create resources. I have a resource for source. Source is just the Scala convenience method to read from text files. Uh, and also a resource for output streams at the bottom. So this is how you would acquire a resource, you will use resource.make right there, and you pass a function that tells you, tells um, the resource.make how to actually acquire the resource, and then you pass another function to say you, how you want to delete it. Um, and in a actual IO application, this is how I actually use my resources. Here I'm just copying from a file and into another file. So don't have to worry about the details. The point I'm trying to make here is that you just need to focus on writing a code and that copies the file, and you don't have to worry about cleaning it up. You don't have to worry about like acquiring it. Um, all these things is handled by the resource uh, type. So, and most importantly of all, of all, most importantly of all, you don't have to worry about resource leaks because um, it's always a clean up at the end of this IO block. Uh, so why this matters? This matters because when you're writing long running services, um, resource leaks is a huge problem. So whenever you have a service, service that's going for, running for a long time, it's very hard to track down resource leaks. Uh, sometimes when you have like a happy path, that's a request coming, you say, oh, all right, I'm gonna close this database connection when the request is over. But what if there's an exception that happens in between? When an exception happens, your resource might be actually be dangling. And it's very hard to track down only after maybe like what what uh, one thousand exceptions, and that only happens maybe after the service has been running for a month. 
So it's very hard to track down. And by the time like 1,000 exceptions have happened, you're like seeing all our database connections and all of our the errors. So that's a bit too late. But so with this resource type, you can do this do it with resource cleaning up and also with exceptions when uh, exceptions happen. So um, right now you might be thinking, where do I start? How do I start writing code that is that uses cat's effect and rather having it on the effects runtime? I would suggest uh, starting out by looking into HTTP4S. Um, this is a library that allows you to write um, HTTP services in a purely functional way. Uh, that's what people can generally use in the CATS ecosystem. The second library that you could explore is FS2. FS2 stands for Functional Streams in Scala. Yeah, so the S, the double S becomes two. So FS2 is a streaming IO library. So think of it like composable, composable streams where you could take, you could drop, you could zip streams, but you could all perform it in an IO monad in a safe and resource friendly way. So for example, the HTTP format library is actually built on top of FS2. So when you actually run a server in FS2 uh, in HTTP 4S, it's using, using the streams in a lazy infinite streams or IO. That's why your server is always running. Yeah. So lastly, here are some references. If you guys want to find out more about Scala, Catifact, and effect systems in general, you could check this out. Uh, you could check out this keynote from Daniel Spiva. Uh, he's the creator of Catifact. Um, I would recommend checking out even if you don't use Scala uh, because it's mostly language agnostics. He also talks about Tokyo uh, for those who use Rust and why really it matters. Um, I think he also does a very good survey of like how people have been using async for a while and how people are really trying to like, squeeze performance out of it. So check that out. Um, if you're into Scala and pure function programming, you Check out this book. It's function programming Scala. I think towards the end, it's really cool. He actually teaches you how to write a very simplified IO model in Scala, uh, and he also goes on to actually implement the streaming IO as well. So yeah, do check it out. Um, especially if you're trying to figure out how whatever I just said works under hood. The last one is uh, more cat centric. Uh, it's helpful if you're wondering what are counters, applicators. Monads, monad laws, one of those things. And it's called Scala with cats. I mean, if you really find those topics really dry, it's actually really nice pictures inside. So, uh, last points for them. Yeah, that's all I have. Any questions from you guys? Software engineers, do you approach functional programming from a mathematical side or as just a way to achieve the results? Question is as a software engineer, do I approach functional programming from a mathematical side or do I just want to get yeah. get the job? <laughs> <laughs> um I would say it really depends. It's a terrible answer, I'm sorry. But uh, yeah, it's really, really, it really depends. Um, so if I'm writing a script, I really just want to get a job done. If I'm just uh, writing uh, uh, something that, just want to automate something I've been doing for like manually for days, I'll just write a script. I don't really care whether I'm using Scala, Python, Ruby. I just want to get it done because uh, it's a really low hanging fruit. And once I do it, my boss get impressed. So I just want to get it done. Um, when I really want to use your functional programming is only when um, I'm actually handling a lot of uh, important things. Uh, so at Pay, uh, we handle money. Uh, you wouldn't want to use something that uh, it's really like clunky, like PHP. Or <laughs> yeah, so um, I would really consider using something more robust. Uh, something that we could actually reason about uh, and something where we could make sure that if we are spending sending money to our customer or taking money from our customer once, it only happened once. <laughs> so those, those kind of things really like this where, uh, yeah, in those situations, I'll use functional programming, pure functional programming. It's a great question.
in the past. Um, do you think container programming will eventually overtake the industry such that people people start abandoning container? Oh, great question. So the question is, do you think, do I think functional programming will overtake the industry and everyone will abandon object-oriented programming? So um, the funny thing is, cats in back, and also uh, I didn't get to mention Zio. Zio is also another runtime, effects runtime, ZIO, uh, another effects runtime on in the Scala community. So the funny thing is, both of these libraries actually embrace uh, a few of these options object-oriented programming concepts. Um, maybe not like really scary ones like, uh, I don't know, visitor patterns or those funny patterns that you guys study in our um, software engineering classes. <laughs> but um, the, the core concepts that you still take, uh, like for example, dependency, dependency injection. I think that's a very important thing that they actually took over from uh, the object-oriented programming world. So the reason why is because um, if I'm write, writing a code like uh, those, I uh, show you right just now. Yeah, something like this maybe. So if I'm write, writing a code like that, um, I would actually not put IOD there. I would actually even put to right here. I would actually use an interface because if I'm testing, it's easier to test if I have a, if I'm not actually writing to the console or writing to the file because I'm testing. If I'm testing my CI, I don't want to be writing to the files. I want to write to maybe the memory. So um, I would actually have an interface there and inject my dependencies uh, using some kind of like really like um, so zero has a very nice dependency injection framework. Uh, so so I will use that to to really help me to test and also. I could change the, the kind of dependencies I would use at different um, scenarios as well. So in test, I would use this dependency. In uh, production, I would use another dependency I would check in. Yeah. And yeah, so those are some things that uh, functional programming are still using from object oriented world, and I think those are available. Um, just that probably people are throwing away those like really complicated stuff, like those funny patterns that you guys have to memorize <laughs> for your classes. <laughs> yeah. Hope I answered the question. Yeah. Uh, I mean, suppose I'll talk so much about this cover, but uh, is there a reason why like Scala might be cheaper over Elixir or other tables of modern functionality? Yeah, good question. Um, because first of all, um, so the question is, is there a reason why scholars favor over other functional programming languages? Uh, the funny answer I give to you for my company is my the very first um, CTO that they hired is a crazy guy. So he was like, let's use Rust. Let's use like all the esoteric like technologies because just because he's the open. Uh, and, and there wasn't a very good like, technical answer, but just over time we realized that hey, actually this is very useful for when you're working on it. Um, uh, but if I were to answer that question from my perspective, uh, actually I, 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 I really quite fond of Elixir, just that there's not a lot of types, <laughs> which I would prefer to have some types to really help me out most of the time, yeah. Yeah. Last question, maybe. <laughs> yeah, great, great question. Uh, I could even tell you what I hate about cats. In fact, as well, like this is this is really very. I hate this. I hate this. Um, because I feel like if I could write, I would just write a tool, right? And everything would be easy. Maybe that's why. Um, I, I, well, the next step for me is to use Haskell <laughs> uh, because everything is lazy. Um, that's why I hate about Cats in fact. Um, the thing about I hate about Scala is um, I think it tries to be a, um, a language that encompasses functional programming, object-oriented programming, and it tries to attract like Haskell programmers. I think it tries too hard to be like uh, this beast. Uh, if you look at it, uh, the definition of Scala on the Scala website, there's this very long uh, explanation, like a very long headline for Scala. Um, 
So, so uh, it says something like functional programming, functional programming, and blah, 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 blah. Uh, it's, it just tries to be too many things. I, I really hope it's like just one thing, like maybe functional programming, let's go all out for that instead of uh, trying to be functional oriented. And, um, or, or you could maybe say, uh, let's focus all our research on types, type systems. I think that would be a great thing moving forward for Scala because uh, Martin Olesky does uh, research in uh, Scala and actually spent a lot of time thinking about the type system as well. But um, I think trying to like bring Java programmers over to the Scala world and try to convince them, things like that. I think that's not uh, great. <laughs> yeah, rather try it tries to focus on what it really wants to be. Uh, you can see there's a lot of um, funny things that they have added on along the along the way. And it really looks like yeah, they're not trying to be focused. Um, and you'll see like Scala 2, there was some things added, and Scala 3 was taken out. So it, it, it just feels like things were not like well thought through. Um, people even call Scala like Martin Olesky's like pet project. So you just like add something in, try it out, and then Scala 3 not take it out. You know, <laughs> it's not great really for uh, people who actually really use that language. Yeah. So those are things that I really like. Thanks. Thanks, guys. I think you think it's from the intermission. You can grab uh, the video together. Okay. And we'll go on for our second topic. I think this was for us. Hi, everyone. Uh, we will begin our second talk. So let's welcome Ron. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Ron. Uh, I, I came from uh, Yuga White. So it's a very, very great database that I will talk about today. So before I can start a session, uh, here are some something you guys may be interested in, that you may stand a chance to win the prize. Okay. So you can join our Slack channel, open Slack channel, and you can also star us on the GitHub because we are an open source project. So everything, 100% open source, okay? And you, if you are interested, you can uh, contribute your code, uh, raise a PR, things like that. So once you start our GitHub, later I will get the, 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 the people who start our GitHub, then I will do a lucky draw. <laughs> then the price will be the t-shirts. Yeah. Then, uh, of course, you want to if you want uh, after the session, if you want to know more about distributed SQL, Yugabyte, etc., then you can sign up for our uh Yugabyte EV University. So it's a free course that you can uh take the course at your free time. All right. Okay, never mind. Oh. Yeah, never mind. So today we will we'll talk about modernized data tier using cloud native database. Okay. So before start, a uh, quick introduction about myself. Uh, before joining Yoga Byte, actually, I worked in various company like Visa, where I was handling on the RDBMS, like a MySQL. My then I moved to Pivotal, not sure if you guys heard of it, uh, where I was doing uh, the data warehouses called Greenplum and uh, e-memory data grid. Then I was then I moved to uh, HP Esmeral, where I was uh, dealing with data platforms as well as AI machine learning and Kubernetes. So this is the agenda for today's talk. So firstly, I will touch base on cloud native evolution. I will assume that this is something new to you guys, like cloud native, right? Then I will touch base a little bit on the database history and how it evolves. Then talk about what is 
what, uh, what is a cloud native database? Why do we need a cloud native database in this world? Since we already have all the databases that you guys are known of, like uh, MongoDB or my MySQL or Postgres, etc. Right? Then we will talk about how you are by the design stand out of all the distributors uh, or cloud native distributed SQL databases. Then at the end, I will do a quick demo by how it looks like. All right. Any questions? Okay, good. So how many of you have heard the term cloud native? Anyone? No one. <laughs> okay. So, but how many of you have heard cloud computing? Okay. Seems like all of you heard computing. Okay. So the cloud computing is actually everything on the right hand side, which we normally refer to the cloud, public clouds, like resource pooling, network access, on demand self service, P as you go, etc. Just name it. Then for cloud native, it's more like how would you run those services? How do you want to bundle these services to run your application on the cloud? So the main difference between cloud native and cloud computing is uh, cloud computing defines where do you want, want to run your application or run your services. But cloud native defines how you run it, which what, what are the uh, services, like cloud services you want to engage in your infrastructures, right? So actually these four, uh, in the core of cloud native, these four factors container, microservices, DevOps, and continuous delivery. So, how many of you have heard containers? Okay, all of you. So, maybe I pick one volunteer who, who can tell us what is a container. Anyone? And some guy. Yes, it's you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just like an environment, it can be on the type of bundle. Okay, like a bundle environment. Then what's the difference between the container and the normal server? Mm -hmm. You can put it everywhere. You can put it everywhere. Uh -huh. The dependency is all Okay, okay. Very close, very close. Later, I'll talk about the definition of uh, what, what, what is container, right? So once we have a container, then on the application level, we have the evolution of cloud native and microservices. So you don't have a, everything bundled into a single jar file, everything, right? All the services bundled into a jar file. Right now you can have different services running different architectures. The DevOps as well. So it actually streamlined the process of your development your uh, in, uh, CI, CI pipeline to build your application, then push, push the, uh, the to your production environment. The whole process becomes more automated. So you won't incur a lot of human errors in the, in the early days, right? So these are the evolution of the infrastructures. At the very, very beginning days, we only have the physical server, right? So you, if you want to run a single application, you need to power on your, your physical server first or prepare the resources of your physical server. It may take hours to days, right? I'm not sure whether you, you guys heard of uh, mainframe, a DB2 mainframe. These are huge chunk of machines. Like even the shipment will take few, few weeks or a few days to do it, right? Before you can even start power on the machine, install the software, etc. Then after that, people feel that the deploying applications or using physical server is very rigid. It's not flexible at all. So people want to have a more flexible way to utilize the resources and a faster way as well. So we have the virtual machines. So I think around two decades ago, Virtualization technologies came into picture, right? You can slice a physical machine into several smaller machines, then each one can run its own operating system, right? Can run its own applications, can have its own storage, etc. 
I think only in this packet we have the containers, right? So the main difference between the virtual machine and container is that there's no guest operating system in the containers. That's why you can see the creation time. If you want to create a virtual machine, it will take minutes, or even you'll start a virtual machine, it may take like few seconds, right? But for, if you create a container, it will take seconds. But if you want to restart or some uh, restart a container, it may take some seconds, right? It's super fast because it doesn't involve the gas operating system. So that's the main difference. So here you can see the traditional physical server, you have a hardware, then you have operating system, then you run your applications. Then when it comes to virtualization technologies, you have a hardware, you have an operating system. This is a physical server, you have an operating system. Then you have a hypervisor, virtualization hypervisor. And then on top of it, you can slice your resources into different virtual machines. Then each virtual machine, as you can see here, has its own operating system. It can be a Windows, it can be a Linux, CentOS, Ubuntu, name it, right? Then we move to containers. As you can see, the main difference here, the underlying looks the same, but instead of a hypervisor, we have container runtime, and we are missing the yes OS. That's why all the containers they run as processes, right? That's how it that's how it operates. So why do we need containers? For three main reasons. The first one is the standardization. So it's self-contained, it is portable. So no matter you run in your, in your local or you run on a cloud or you run on on-prime, right? On AWS, GCP, Azure, whatever it is, it is the it same, right? You don't need to change anything. And it's platform agnostic. It can be in your own laptop running a Docker container. You can run it, uh, run it in the Kubernetes cluster on uh, EKS, GKE, whatever cloud you are, uh, you prefer. And also reduction, it has a better resource utilization compared to VMs, right? It's very lightweight and there's no guest OS. Maybe for you guys uh, may, may, may not uh, truly uh, experience the industri industrial world, for enterprises, actually they pay a lot of money on the OS. So for each virtual machine, for example, if they're running a Red Hat Linux, they pay like millions of dollars every year for that. The third one is secure. So it's for isolation and uh, it, it has immutable images. Then we talk about, after we talk about containers, then there's a change on the application architecture. So from monolithic, to the microservices. So let's see what the monolithic application architecture looks like. So you have one application, single application, then you have your uh, front end, you have your backend different services. Then on top of that, you have a load balancer. Then all your requests, no matter is from the browser or, or from your mobile or desktop, all goes to the, the single load balancer. Then the request will be routed to the UI, then brought it to different backend services, right? Then at the end, backend, you have one database to hold all the data. The main difference between monolithic and microservices is that you are kind of taking each and every service out of the single box. So each one can operate on its own. For example, if you are, if you are updating a, a catalog service. So you won't you won't be touching the payment service, order service, or any other services. So it can operate on its own. So that from the user perspective, not all the services will be impacted, right? You can still, for example, make your payment or whatsoever, right? There was a challenge for the uh, application modernization. So this is the traditional stack, right? User interface, then you have uh, your monolithic application. 
then you have what database attached to it. All right, this is a very standard old fashioned architecture. Now, when we have the modernization on the application layer, we can bring the monolithic application to different microservices. For example, for after the user interface, you can have different services over here, but at the back end, you are still attached to a single, single instance of, for example, Postgres. Right? If you want to deploy the same services into another region, or you want to expand your current application, then you well, you are thinking of maybe just duplicate everything, like mirror image, right? Deploy everything. And sometimes it's very hard to get the data in sync. And that's a problem that a lot of enterprises now are facing right now. So each location, they have their own set of data, and data synchronization become a pain. Okay, before I move on to the database history and cloud native database, any questions on the cloud native evolution about the uh, microservices architecture? All good? Cool. So let's jump on to the history of database. So in 1970, uh, this guy, uh, EF Cole, he has, he's actually the father of the relational databases or relational RDBMS, relational database management systems. So one of his model, something like this. So you have different tables, then across different tables, you have referential integrities across. Some of you have foreign keys over there, right? And back then there were two prototypes. One is uh, Ingress developed by UBC in the US. Then the other one is more famous called System R developed by IBM. Then in 1976, the ER diagrams came into picture. I, I, I thought uh, maybe, maybe you guys already started in the uni for the ER diagrams. When, they, when you want to design your databases, how do you design your data models, etc. Right. Then in 1980s, here comes a SQL, Structured Query Language. So that's the language that you guys may deal with on a daily basis, like to write queries, insert, update, delete, create, blah, blah, blah. Then in, in 1990s, that's the booming of the relational databases. I think some of these logos may be very familiar to you guys, like uh, Postgres or MySQL. So these are these two are the open source databases. Of course, they have the re relevant uh, enterprise versions, but they started with open source. You can download and use it, right? I think you guys may already use it in some of your school projects or whatsoever. And on the top, heard of it, but never use it. Right? Those are the proprietary databases like uh, IBM DB2, Oracle, and SQL Server. Right? They are stable, and at the same time, they are super expensive. So along the way, we have seen that the infrastructure modernization. Like we have the cloud, we have a virtualization, right? We have, and we have more and more commodity hardware. So we have seen the modernization on the infrastructure level. And also because of the infrastructure modernization, we also, because of the uh, invention of the containers, we have seen the modernization on the application layer. Like we have seen the uh, microservices, we have seen the cloud native architecture. We have seen Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is nothing but a container orchestration platform, right? Then here comes the, the problem. Then how do we, or when do we modernize our data layer, right? So here are some of the problems of traditional databases like Postgres or MySQL. Like the, the 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 binaries or or the product that you use in your school projects. The first thing is the scalability. 
So right now you can you can quickly spin up my MySQL instance to your local desktop or whatever, right? So it will have its own, it will slice, it will just utilize whatever resources you have on your laptop. But what if in an enterprise setup, you have a huge amount of data, then the databases may that single instance may not be able to cope with, right? How do you scale it? Normally, people will talk about vertical scaling. So it will pump in more CPU and memories. Like instead of an eight core, 16 GB uh, RAM machine, we give a 16 core machine, right? However, uh, there's a cap on it. For example, on AWS, I think uh, the largest VM uh, you can get is 96 core. Right. Then the, the only solution is how is there a better way we can scale horizontally? So instead of bumping the CPU from eight core to 16 core, why not we add another eight core machine? Then continue at 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 right. And just FYI, a six a 16 core machine is more expensive than two eight core machines. That's a whole concept of commodity hardware. Then another problem is the performance bottleneck. Just now you have seen this, this architecture. So when, when the data kind of grows, then how do people cope with it, right? So there's one solution, I would say intermediate solution, not the real solution. People will attach another instance to the original instance. They call it the active standby or master slave or leader follower setup. So that there is, there is an asynchronous replication of data constantly from the master server to the standby server. And in this setup, so they can do a so-called the read and write split. So all the reads, uh, all the writes will still go to this single uh, master node but because of the standby node will sync all the data over here, so you can actually read from your standby node. So those requests won't be impacting the performance of your master node, right? Same promising, but there's a catch. All the writes still goes to the master server. What if you have a tons of writes? How do you solve the problem, right? You still have the bottleneck of uh, Single single note of writing. Then there comes the cloud native database to address such issues. So how do we define a cloud native cloud native database, or what is the characteristics of a cloud native database? So they have normally they have four characteristics: elastic scalability, high availability, high throughput easy to pick up. I will work through them one by one. So for el elastic scalability, basically it means, for example, right now I have a three node database cluster already running, so the data is in sync as well. Then if I was, if I'm facing a performance issue or capacity issue, I can simply add a new node to the cluster. Right. And while I was adding the new node to the cluster, the application should still up and running. Right. Application, application shouldn't know like what's at the back end. If there's any changes, it should still up and running. And this whole process should be uh should not involve a lot of manual work. It should be as much as possible automated. Then the second characteristic of a cloud native database is high availability. So basically, it's a resiliency. For example, you have a four node just now, you already added one node into a cluster. You have a four node cluster right now. Then what happens if one of the node goes down? Normally, in the in the setup that uh, uh master slave kind of thing, when your master node goes down, what happens? Your application goes down, right? Because you, you can't read and write uh, the, the data to, to your database. 
But for, for a correlated database, even if one of the nodes goes down, you still have data in other nodes which can serve the data to your applications. That should be the, 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 the system itself should be resilient enough to sustain such failures, right? The, the next one is high throughput. So instead of you have a single node to take all the read and write or single node to take the, all the traffic, you should have the cluster of nodes to take all the traffic. And each one of the node should take the request, right? Not, not pushing all the read or, or write requests to a single node until that node become the bottleneck. You should, you should kind of as much as possible even up the workload to all the nodes, right? So all the nodes will take the read and write request so that it has a much better performance the last one, easy to pick up. So I know a lot of you may in the future become a developer. So if, if you are already a developer, for example, you are developing your application in let's say Postgres. Right now, I, I tell you that you need to build an application using a new database. They call it cloud-native database. But you need to change your database language. You need to change your ORMs. You need to change everything that you previously follow using Postgres. Would you do it? Not many people will take a pause, right? How, how long do I need to learn it, right? Then uh, what's all, uh, what are the obstacles over there, right? People will take a pause and I mean, Maybe 80% or more than half of the developers, they will say no, right? It will affect their current progress. So for cloud native database, one of the key factors is that it should rely on the existing, no matter it's a database language or framework or developing language, or programming language that developers are already familiar with. So taking the same example, you are, you are developing the application using the Postgres. Then right now I'm telling you that there's a better cloud native database and do all the resiliency, you know, can scale out. At the same time, you don't need to change your code. You can use the same, uh, same way that you design your Postgres, right? Would you take it? Probably you will take a try, right? So next, let's take a look at a Yuga by DB, a cloud native distributed SQL. So on the left hand side is a monolithic architecture, and on the right on, in the middle is a microservices architecture. You can see that these services, databases, and infrastructure are more tightly coupled, right? So they need a more flexible, resilient, as well as to cater for the capacity of the microservices architecture. So what is a distributed SQL? Distributed SQL is a SQL by itself and it supports transactions, business transactions. And it has a very, very good resiliency and it can scale horizontally, not only vertically, but also horizontally then it can distribute the data across different geographic locations and it should be open source. So generally the distributed SQL database, they have three, uh, three tier architecture. They have a SQL API, which provides the same API as some common database, uh, common databases that people are familiar with, for example, Postgres, right? So once, uh, once the query is fired in, then there's a distributed query engine. They do the query, uh, for example, optimization, query parser, query executor, etc. Right? Once that is done, then your data will be stored somewhere, right? 
Then the third layer is a distributed data storage. So how does distributed SQL database solve the problem of capacity? Right, if your single instance can only hold, for example, two terabyte of data, then how does how does it work? Right, did you share the cut the table into different pieces? All this, right? People may wonder. So the distributed SQL does all this stuff under this layer, the data storage layer. It does the auto data sharding. So when you write the data to a table, the data is automatically sharded. So you don't need to worry where does the data sits. You only need to know, okay, the data is there. It's already sharded and it's highly resilient. That's all you need to know. So in the one liner to summarize what is Yuga by EB, so it's a transactional distributed SQL database designed for resiliency and scalability. And it is 100% open source, Postgres compatible. Uh, how many of you have heard of NoSQL? Okay. I think maybe all of you have used it. What, what are the popular uh, popular ones you guys are using? MongoDB? Cassandra? Oh, sorry? What's that? Dynamo. Oh, then MongoDB. Okay. So if you guys already use NoSQL, so you might be already familiar with the advantages that it brings, right? For example, the resiliency, scalability, it has multi nodes, right? The cluster. And can distribute distribute the data across different locations, but the problem with no no SQL database is that they don't follow a strict relational data model, right? It can be key value pairs, it can be document store, right? But it you 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 doesn't have a really strict uh, relational data models. You cannot have a referential integrity across different you know tables like the RDMS does, right? So normally for the business uh, transactions, they will they will prefer to use relational databases because they offer consistency. And also people are more familiar with the uh, SQL interface and security features as well. So what Yuga by EB is trying to do is to combine the advantage of both relational world and also non-relational non world, no, no SQL databases. And on top of that, we want it to be future proof. So it's 100% open source. So people can, can download the binaries from the GitHub. And uh, we want to make the deployment model to be flexible enough. So it can be deployed in your own laptop. It can be deployed on the servers. It can be deployed on the VMs. It can be deployed on all the clouds, AWS, GCP, Azure, whatever the environment, it can be deploy into containers as well in Kubernetes. So we don't want to lock in like a, you, you must run this in VM or whatsoever. Right. So this is a high level architecture of the Yuga by DB. So it has two layers. Upper layer is a query layer. So then on the bottom is a storage layer. So we don't want to introduce another database but we want to have a data platform. So we offer, currently we offer two APIs. One is YSQL API, which is Postgres compatible API. So meaning that if you are currently already developing an application using Postgres as a database, you can straight away use that same API to use your company. That's how easy it is. Then we also want to provide the same level of business to the NoSQL users, so they can use the Cassandra API, right? And there are other APIs built in the future. It may be a GraphQL, it may be a MySQL, so it, it depends. So the whole idea is we want it to be a data platform rather than another database for people to choose. And on the bottom is a distributed transactional storage layer. As I mentioned just now, this is where the all the amazing stuff happens, right? It does automatic the sharding, uh, automatic sharding, so it will cut the table into different smaller pieces. It does load balancing. It does the distributed transactions. Then the data replication is done through the rough consensus algorithm, right? 
Also, as I mentioned, uh, it's infrastructure and platform agnostic. It can be deployed into any infrastructure of your choice. AWS, GCP, Azure, OpenShift, Webmer, Tanzu, any type of Kubernetes you're having, on-prime data centers as well. So for different types of workload, we can, you can use different APIs. So if you are if you are building a microservices that requires relational integrity, then people may turn to use the Postgres compatible API, right? But if you are building a something that may not require referential integrity, but with a huge or massive scale, then you may use the Cassandra API, right? So just now we talked about one of the key characteristics of cloud-native database is their resiliency, right? Then for this diagram, uh, I'm able to show that how the deployment model of Yugabyte DB relates to the resiliency. So on the left-hand side, as you can see, it can deploy in a single region, multiple zone. For example, when you, when you can deploy into AWS, Singapore, okay. Singapore is an AWS region, right? Then it has three different availability zones. So basically, means three different data centers in Singapore. So in in this case, if any of the data center is gone, there are still two copies of data over there serving the traffic. So your application is still up and running and reading and writing from the database. So from the uh, from the application perspective, there's no downtime. That's how we made it resilient. And also we can deploy it into single cloud multi-region. Same example, on AWS, we can deploy the single cluster across AWS Singapore, AWS Tokyo, AWS Sydney. So in case the C all the Sydney, AWS Sydney servers are gone, we are still able to serve the data from the region Singapore and Tokyo, right? You can also deploy in a multi-cloud, multi-region fashion, like one in AWS, one in GCP, one in Azure. So even if one of the cloud is down, then you can your your system is still up and running. And this setup the so-called the, the asynchronous replication just now. Just now for all these architecture, the data between these three nodes or three copies are strongly consistent. So whenever you are querying from any node, the data will be the same. Then for this type, the data replication is asynchronous. Asynchronous basically is that I will send the data to you and you make sure you re uh, execute it, receive it and execute it, I don't care. I just continue to execute on my side, right? So this is the normal replication topology used by the traditional databases like MySQL, Postgres. They normally have the same asynchronous replication. So we offer that option as well. So if you prefer. Then I will do a very, very quick demo of how the database looks like and how do we deploy such databases? Okay. You guys see my Okay. So this will be the model that, that we will be using to deploy the Yugabyte DB cluster. So this model is more like a management model as well as an orchestration model. So on this dashboard, you can see all my clusters over here, right? So we can see how many clusters are up and running, how many clusters are in pause state, how many clusters are in error state, right? As you can see, I have, uh, so universe is just equivalent to clusters. It's just another sexy name. So I have uh, 34 clusters with 100 plus nodes because I'm running on the 
uh, public cloud, so I'm able to see the expected monthly cost as well. So in order to use this platform to spin up cluster, it's fairly simple. You can just configure your underlying infrastructures. So your underlying infrastructure can be AWS, GCP, Azure, Webmer, Tanzu, OpenShift, any managed Kubernetes, like it can be AWS, GCP, Azure, blah, 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 or on prime data centers. So all you need to do is to key to give your AWS account, like uh, the access key ID and secret access key. Then after that, once it is configured, to create a cluster will be as simple as several clicks. For example, I want to save test. Then for example, I want to deploy in Singapore. If I have three nodes cluster, then for each AZ, it will have one node. If I have six node cluster, then for each AZ, then I have two nodes. Then of course I can define what's the instance type I want. I can define how many storage I want to allocate it to the nodes. Okay. Then I can, whether I want to enable the PRS or uh, so-called the encryption in transit. Okay. So I can simply click create, then it will create a cluster. So behind the scene, what it does after I click the create, it is it will go to the AWS, it will use your, your own AWS account to provision, first provision the EC2 instance, uh, install the OS, install the database binaries to configure the database clusters, then get it ready for you to use. So everything will be automated. I have one created cluster over here. So I have a four node cluster created in Singapore across three different uh, availability zones. Uh, you can see the nodes over here. I have four nodes. Then uh, AZ1A has two nodes. The other two AZs has one node. Then another interesting about the platform is that it has the matrix built in. So if you want to see how many operations per second, like what's your delete, insert, select, update per second over here, as well as the latencies, CPU usage, memory usage, this IOPS, all these metrics you can view from the bottom. Right. You, can, you can do your backups a lot. So the, you guys may, may be wondering, like uh, just now you mentioned, uh, it is scalable, right? You can scale horizontally scale. Now, how do I scale in this case? So if you want to scale, you just edit the cluster, for example, you want to scale from four nodes to five nodes. All you need to do is change the number from four to five. Then hit save. Then under the hood, what it's trying to do is that it will try to provision a new VM, EC2 VM, then install the OS, install the binary, then add it back to this cluster. As you can see here, it will provision the node, it will install software, update uh, the database configurations, then configure the whole cluster, wait for data migrations. Right. So once you for the scaling, when you add the node, because when you just add the node, there's no data at all, and you want to balance out, right? So the data will be slowly migrated to this node as well. So everything will be handled on by the platform itself. So it will be transparent to the developers. It will be transparent to the end users. It will also be transparent to the application itself, right? So your application won't be knowing that your backend databases are doing the scaling at the moment. It will continue to read and write as long as there are uh, results returned from the query, then the database, uh, your application will continue to run. Right? I think uh, that's that's all I want to share. Uh, I have few questions, quiz. Okay.
<laughs> I have specs to give as well. All right. So if you know the answer, please raise up your hands. Okay. First one, what are the four core concepts in cloud native? A, container, microservices, DevOps, continuous delivery. B, Docker, microservices, DevOps, continuous integration. C, Docker, microservices, DevOps, continuous delivery. D, container, microservices, continuous integration, and continuous delivery. Yes. Yes, correct. It's A. Oh. Thank you. Okay, second one. What makes it a true cloud native database? If you know answer, just read up your hands. Yes. Yes, correct. <laughs> Thank you. Question three, compared to the traditional RDBMS, what additional capabilities do cloud native database, uh, do cloud native distributed SQL database deliver? Anyone? Yes. Which one? D, all of the above. Yes, correct. Okay, two more questions. What data assess API does Yugawa EV support? Yes. Which one? Both A and B. Yes. Last one. Where can you come to be, be deployed? You sure? I give you one more chance. <laughs> What's your answer? <laughs> I'm asking you. <laughs> huh? Okay, I'll give you another chance. Last chance. Okay. Make up your mind. E or F? Huh? Sorry? Okay. All right. I think uh, that's all I want to share. I'm not sure whether you guys already uh, start us on the GitHub. If not, uh, please uh, do it right now. So I will do the lucky draw. Okay, we have some people already start. One. If your name is not here, please start now. 
Miss Beef, your name is not here. It's like Friday night bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> <laughs> Still these people? Okay. If that is the case. Okay, 11 people. Then we'll get five lucky guys out of these 11 people. <laughs> Okay, who is the first lucky guy? Oh, whose ID is that? Okay, come on. Thank you. Okay, next one. Oh, you will give me sorry. No more, no more. Leave other sections. Whose idea is this? Thank you. Okay. Uh, lucky guy. Come on. You should buy a photo today. Who's that? Congratulations. Okay. Next lucky guy. Ian. <laughs> Last one. Spikes in the hand. Guys, work harder. <laughs> Spikes in the hand. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay, both things. All right. Thank you, thank you guys. Uh, thank you for joining today. So if you have any questions, doubts, you can always reach out to me or join the, our community Slack and ask questions. All right, thank you. Yeah, um, thank you guys for coming. Uh, we just like to do a shout out to Get Rates for sponsoring this venue. Also look good. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for coming.